Hello, Facebook. I have Dan Kirby here with me today, architect extraordinaire, uh, community member, and so much more. You can see his scrolling bio there in the post. Incredible, incredible work that you've been doing. Dan, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. So, um, Miranda, uh, I'm an architect and urban planner. That's kind of my, um, my occupation and my heart. Uh, I am a longtime Orlando uh, resident and have been active on a lot of fronts um, in the community, politically, um, in different um, social justice work, um, being an advocate for sustainability, um, you know, kind of a, across a, a range of different areas, but really trying to advocate for, I'm a real geek for cities and places and being around people and and trying to make all that mess work better. I mean, in general, that that's that's my story. Our passions really parallel. I saw Neil Schweitzer, and my heart kind of did this little uh, <laughs> flitter flitter flatter. Uh, I, I think it's really incredible. Not only um, do you have a passion for community and advocacy, but you were one of the first, if not the first, I saw African American architect. On um, can you talk a little bit about that? And yeah, I mean, th this this is a conversation that um, I've been engaged in for a long time, and we could probably have for a very long time. Um, African Americans in the architecture profession, there are a very small uh, percentage of us. I think we account for less than two percent of the entire profession. So it's a it's a it's a rarity you know, that a African-American would be engaged in the old gentleman's profession um, and a master builder in that sort of pivotal role. Um, it's something that I wanted to do. Um, I was exposed to it very young, sort of by uh, just a chance occurrence. So I'm from Newark, New Jersey, and we can kind of talk about that a, uh, a little bit later, because that that informs a lot of the, the the person that I am today, as well. But I was in a completely, I was in a bubble in a completely African American community for all the way through fourth grade. Okay, we went to a black church. All of our neighbors were black, uh, with a few exceptions, a kind of smattering of. Uh, of uh, maybe some Puerto Ricans and we would go to different parts of the city and see Italians and Portuguese people and some Jewish people. But that was kind of, that was it. That's what you saw in Newark, New Jersey when I was coming up. Um, Dan, so I'm, oh, in, I'm sorry. You know, so just tell you how I got in the architecture thing. So going to that church, my dad was very active in one of the leaders in the church and that church took place in this factory building as a, um, a converted factory building and the church kind of held um, its service in one corner of this large space on the second floor of this building. So one day, my, one night my dad comes home and he's got a set of blueprints uh, under his arm. And on the cover of the blueprints, I never forget, there was a, a rendering of how this factory building was gonna be transformed into this really cool looking modern structure and everything. And just as a tiny little kid, when not ever, all anyone wanted to do was be a, a firefighter Parkman, or a policeman. I said, I said to my dad, who does that? Who's able to make that happen? He goes, oh, these come from the architect. And that's when it kind of set me on this road to say, I want to be an architect. How old were you? Oh gosh, I probably was seven years, six or seven <sighs> years old. That's incredible. And look at you today. You've, you followed through with that passion and led that path. That's remarkable. And I, I, well, I'd answer architect to what I want to be and people would kind of go, what's that? What is that? Yeah. So a lot of the reason I think we haven't made great strides to have the, the quantities in the profession, part of its exposure, that mm -hmm. this is even a possibility of a thing to do and then secondly, relevance, like the people don't see the purpose, the um, role that we play in shaping people's lives. Uh, mm -hmm. Everything from how healthy you are, how your day goes, if you have daylight, if you have 
healthy air in a facility, uh, if you're in a well-planned space that's conducive to your success, goes back to architecture. Absolutely. And, and that shouldn't be a right, a privilege of the few. It's something that's owed to everyone. You know, nothing, you know, bothers me more than, you know, why do we have, why do we have people sentenced to being and operating and living in and working in poor spaces and poor conditions there that that's unacceptable. I agree with you entirely. It's very limiting to the ability to the, insp the capacity for inspiration and being inspired comes a lot of times from our natural surroundings. And like you said, the sunlight in and of itself, how a home is positioned on a lot where that sunrise and sunset come into play. There's so many factors in how those rooms are designed and the creative intellect that goes into planning architecture is such a beautiful, beautiful thing. I, I, you know, when I first asked you to have this discussion, you were very open and raw with me and I respect that. You're like, Miranda, I wanna have a conversation between two friends. I just wanna have a natural open dialogue. And I know I asked and requested to talk about some uncomfortable topics and I don't always know where to begin in those conversations or even how to navigate them. So I trust and respect you to lead through that. And I really respect the fact that you kind of stood your ground and said what you wanted to get out of this and how you wanted to share your story. And um, as someone who's passionate about architecture and who also grew up in a very isolated bubble, mine was quite the opposite, a town of 1300 Norwegians, Germans, a couple of Irish people. I mean, the only thing we saw for diversity was on television. Uh, we definitely had our own but you're right, the opportunities that we were raised with, the options that we were taught were what surrounded us. And right, right. in my culture, that was predominantly, you were either going into the military, you were going to work at one of the local factories, or you would go into the medical field. So I think it's true that our opportunities are really what we're surrounded by. And the fact that you were able to stumble across architecture, what a great opportunity to, to go a different path. Let's spend a minute on that because yeah. that's like, I know you, that was where you started, but clearly not where you ended up, right? right. And it, that was where I started, but clearly not where I ended up. So I was in that bubble. I was going to a school where African-American history was valued. We were taught that very kind of, there's a lot of very important African-American activism that came out of that time period in Newark, New Jersey. And um, so people were very committed to that. But I went, I went from that environment, you know, which was insular, to an environment where I was immediately then the total minority. So before our family moved to Florida, uh, when it was time for me to go to fifth grade, my, um, the teachers came to my parents and said, hey, we think your son has some promise. Don't keep sending him to public middle school. Here's a list of private schools. Get him into one of them. Wow. So my, my mother starts calling down the list and they're all saying, oh, well, we really don't have a space. Where are you from? You're, you're, you, you actually live in Newark, Newark? You know, so she manages to get me tested for one of these schools. Wow. I go out on a Saturday to test. They were all very nice. And they said, yeah, you know, we don't have any spots for fall. Um, you know, we do have, we're forming a waiting list. You know, we'll let you know. So the next Tuesday, my mother gets a call and they say, I guess they got the test results. I don't know. They said, we have a spot for your son. So I leave my school in Newark and then I go to school. And if people that know New Jersey would kind of know this um, pretty well, I go to school in Short Hills, New Jersey. So I'm going to one of the best prep schools in all of New Jersey. And I am clearly now the minority. So there are at this school that's got, you know, probably close to 600 students in the lower school. There's five minority students, persons of color, um, you know, uh, just a, maybe I think there were three of us that were black and maybe um, uh, one that was one or you know, two that were, were Indian, you know, it was, it was just a, it was, it was, the, it was a flip, completely yeah. flip reverse environment. And instead wow. of going to school in an inner city school, I'm now going to school where these are the children of the wealthy. Okay. 
and mm-hmm. they were uh, very comfortable and very privileged and they had yeah. all the trappings and I, I'm kind of I, I had this conversation with my daughter because the school she went to in fifth grade here in Orlando wasn't nearly as nice as the one I went to <laughs> in fifth grade. I but can imagine. <laughs> I go to the school and I'm dropped in this environment and it is like being dropped on another planet because all of the support and encouragement right. and the emphasis and the things that are important and how I'm valued and my place in the whole society there and everything changed overnight the opposite different of the experience that I had up until that point and I I know I look at my parents and I know my parents were thinking we're going to give our kid the best opportunity that we can because that's what parents do yeah. and the other hand I look back on it and I go oh my god they never they never talked to me about this <laughs> transition or or how do you how do you deal with this yeah so that was a that but going through that kind of a shock help shape who I am today, which is I'm very comfortable. If I know the language, I'm comfortable in a lot of different circles. I'm, I'm, I'm good. Drop me in there. We'll talk. We'll deal with it. That's incredible. I have goosebumps listening to your story. I can only imagine how it must have felt, you know, embracing that transition and navigating that space originally. I mean, going back to your fifth grade self, what were some of your thoughts and feelings internally and how did you cope with that transition? Well, you, you don't embrace it, right? You like go, what happened? You know, when I'm, I'm listening to, um, again, the conversations, the talks about, oh, well, we went, we went here to summer camp and here on our vacation and we went to our vacation home and, yeah. and yeah, we had domestics that live in the house and all this is kind of alien talk to me. Mm-hmm. And then they would kind of go, where are you from? And I'd say, well, I'm from Newark. Well, what that meant is the school bus didn't come anywhere near where I, where we lived. Yeah. So in the mornings, my dad would drive me up to South Orange, right in front of Seton Hall University. And I get the school bus to take me the rest of the way from there. And mm-hmm. in the afternoons, I take that school bus back to that stop and take two city buses back to my house. So this is what I'm doing in you know fifth and sixth grade but it just seemed like that's that's what you do to kind of make your way in the world wow i mean the foundation that your parents fostered you with and the opportunities that they secured for you uh, is a rare chance and opportunity for a lot of people in general um you know um I was just talking with Gannett Gittens Roberts uh, about classism and her upbringing in Ghana and how different it was, the social economic structure there. And what you're speaking to too is a different level of kind of the issue of what's happening presently is the socioeconomic divide and the opportunity to take advancements. So um, I'm gonna let you just free form talk about that space however you see fit versus sure. asking you specific I'll, questions. I'll share a little bit about more about kind of how I got here and then we can yeah. kind of talk about this, this conversation and what's going on in the broader society. So again, that wasn't the end, right? So I went through that and my family, my dad said, decides my dad's retiring and he says, we're getting the heck out of New Jersey. I don't want to spend another night in this town. So the choices are to go to the small town and both my parents from, from rural Georgia, by the way. Yeah. So we can go to the town where my mother is from and my grandparents lived in Georgia okay. or we could come to Orlando, Florida. So I was very happy that the choice was Orlando and I went to high school here in Orlando. Really? Then That's cool. It, totally different cultural experience yet again. <laughs> you know, the back at the time, the back two rows of the parking lot at my high school were all pickup trucks on, on lift kits, you know, cause that was, you know, our, the slogan was the, the pride of the sticks back then, you know? So that's a kind of was, it was a, both a suburban, suburban environment. And then this kind of whole element of um, uh, Southern good old boys yeah. that I had not, well, I shouldn't say I hadn't encountered them, but I hadn't spent any um, considerable time with them. So as I was coming up, I had always gone to my grandparents' place during the summer. Yeah. And that taught me a lot too, because they lived, they operated a, a funeral home in this 
little small town, like a one room funeral home in, well, I guess it had three rooms, but okay. Really <laughs> tiny building that my grandfather had built himself next to their house on this plot of land at the top of the hill. He was a sharecropper. He, they operated a, a, a general uh, kind of a, a roadside store with a, um, um, uh, you know, the, the gas and then candies and stuff. And they ran the funeral home and the ambulance service because there was no, there was no, um, there was no um, hospital in this town. So that was sort of this level of both being entrepreneurs, but also providing community service that I was introduced to in this really small town environment but by my grandfather who would keep his shotgun leaning against the uh um uh, uh next to the front door yeah. and those kids just knew not to touch it don't touch it um, but he'd, he'd keep it there he would tell the story of you know he goes you see that hill right there because the clan marched up that hill and i sat right here on this porch with my shotgun you know <laughs> so <laughs> that's i the can't even of, imagine what that would have felt like from his perspective but it, it, right, it's crazy. But it's a it's a really rich history because yeah. you think of generations and how quickly that all happens. Yeah. So my my father was um, older. My father was in his mid fifties when I was born. Okay? okay. So with that, my father's grandparents were slaves. Okay. So it's not even that far removed. I feel like it's so long ago, but it's literally just a touch away from right. being yesterday. Right, right. Wow. So it, it, this, is, this is all right there and it's real, it's real history. And I think that is why it's so troubling to watch what the generation, what everybody's going through now, because you feel like, folks, we learned some of these lessons already. We've been yeah. through this fight. Truth is, the fight never, it never does end. Um, this is an this is an ongoing thing and it's going to be present in our lives. It's right. It's America's original sin. This is, this is part of who we are. Um, you know, a little bit about the kind of the conversation that, um, so you invited me to do this. And I, I, yeah. I was in a place when you invited me where I was pretty frustrated and pretty angry and pretty disappointed. And I've kind of come in and out of that, particularly over the last um, couple weeks. And, you know, some moments of this, I admit, are better than others. But these are clearly trying times for everybody, right? Not only we're all already locked down and everything, but then this, you know, we are able to witness yet again, a huge injustice taking place. And here's why that hurts so much. Because there was a total denial of George Floyd's humanity. He simply, it was every signal to say, you don't matter. I will casually and callously treat you this way. And, you know, I, I know people are feeling fatigue over that and people don't want to, I don't want to talk about it or I don't want to experience that anymore. Or can't we just move on to something else? But the the truth is moving on to something else is a luxury that African-Americans making our way through this world, we are not afforded, okay? Um, you, you know the concept of, of microaggressions? Yeah. Just, just recently becoming aware of, I didn't realize how ignorant I was about so many things until the last few weeks. So please, for the people watching who don't know about microaggressions, please enlighten us. So microaggressions, it's, it's funny because I, I, you know, up until even kind of doing this work up until a certain point, I kind of thought, oh, that's a, that's, that's a bunch of crap. That's just kind of something somebody's come up with, you know, and they need to get a little tougher, but that's, that's not true because you can see it play out every day all the time. What it really is, is it's a, it's a slight, whether it's intentional or, or inadvertent, usually inadvertent, um, on something related to um, a, a, a condition, not a condition, related to someone's um, experience. It's calling out the other constantly. I think, I think that's probably a, a good way to put it, um, but it's doing it in such a way that diminishes that person, okay? And it's constant. If somebody makes a remark on 
um, I, I don't know, the, the, let's take hair for one thing, okay? Um, you know, I, I don't know, Go, going to stay in a hotel room in that little shampoo bottle, when I realize I picked that thing up and there's no way I can put that on my hair because it's going to completely dry it out. Yeah. You know, it's that sort of thing, but it happens in conversation. It happens in comments about people in makeup, about swimming, about sports, about body appearance. I mean, it's all this stuff is constant in, in, in it. On every kind of, front. Right. What, in, and why should, because it, it, it's, it's baked in, it's really, it's really baked in a lot of cases. I mean, yeah. there are different types of, of racism. There's, there's ideological racism. Okay. Just, I hate, I hate you because of, uh, 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 what you represent. There's there in, in who you are, there's institutional racism and that functions in lots of forms. People able to, you know, get loans from banks, are they steered in terms of real estate, right? And then there's interpersonal ra uh, racism. Just, I'm going to react to you and treat you differently because you're the other. Sometimes that's paternalistic. Um, oh, look at those poor black people. You know, it's the, it's the uh, I, was, I was watching a video and uh, it showed a, a older black gentleman standing in line at a restaurant and the lady um, approaches him and, says it says in and says oh i'm i'm sorry would you like uh this this uh, she wanted to offer him some money because she thought he was homeless <laughs> you know is that, it's, it's that sort of thing which, <laughs> which is which has happened to it's happened to us so many times it's, it, yeah. this this is it, it's constant so it's not even building to the level of fearing for your own personal safety in terms of the police so i've been profiled by the police i've been talked to negatively by the police you think, oh well, if you live a model life, right? You you model citizen. Oh, this you know this won't affect you. That's nonsense because it, it affects all of us because there are assumptions made about me and who I am just because of my race. Before they before you even have an opportunity to open your mouth and articulate a sentence, you're already fighting predispositions and judgments, and even in this space, offering up the opportunity to have these discussions. I'm afraid of coming across in a way that is not helping you. Um, wow, words. So my friend Jim Hobart actually just posted a video last night that I'm gonna put on a link in the comments to this because it speaks to what you talked about as far as America never embracing the fact that, um, taking accountability for the fact that this hasn't been resolved and kind of the symbolism and things um, around this subject and the fact that I can sit here and have a conversation with you, Dan, and not even be able to articulate sentences myself because it's uncomfortable and we don't know how to navigate this space. We don't have these conversations. We, you know, you and I can see each other in a room and at an event and both be at the same event. And you'll, you might be feeling something completely different than I am. And we've never, like, we don't talk about these things publicly and I'm not good at it. The and, the, yeah. The first thing you have to do is acknowledge it, right? So yeah. I, I have a um, there's 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 so many stories. One, um, um, uh, my pastor recently used as a he he was making an illustration. My pastor's a, um, a, a white guy. He's not African American currently, right? Um, he's never been an African American. But what I'm saying is the, <laughs> the pastor of my church has a white guy. Okay, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's establish that. So he was relaying a story about the interaction of his son with the police. Yeah. And it was kind of a jokey joke story about, you know, his son getting um, uh, uh, their interaction with the police. And, you know, um, uh, I think they said they put him in the back of the police car, you know, it's kind of a joke and everything. And I was so taken aback by the story because I know that, you know, as an African-American perspective, that's a very traumatic thing that I went to him and I said, hey, that's not cool what you have to realize is what that represents um, to African-Americans is not, it's not okay. And it's yeah. not a jokey joke story of being encountered with police. And it really speaks to a position of privilege. And he was, it was actually very, it's very cool about it because he acknowledged um, that, you know, I had not thought of it that way. I didn't mean it that way. And, and, and so we do have to confront these things. And I think it was a, it was a, it was a good, moment 
to talk about, to have the kind of conversations that people need to be having now. Yes. So this is, this is something I, I, I want to make sure to say. So, and this is what probably a lot of what is angered me lately, is people don't get to claim that they are loving and decent while they have and allow things that are indecent to be done on their behalf. They don't get to claim, oh, I'm not racist. I didn't do any of that stuff. I didn't own slaves. While they do racist things, while they hurt people simply because of their race, it's not okay. I had a, 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 another architect that made some comments online that, um, earlier this week, and, and he says, oh, I don't believe that the police treat African-Americans any different. And I had to stop my communication with him because just sort of a very factual thing that happens, he refused to acknowledge. And there are a lot of people that refuse to acknowledge right now. And part of that is acknowledging it, it's uncomfortable. Yeah. It, it causes some trauma to you to have to acknowledge that these things have gone on and will go on. It causes a lot, I'm gonna say a lot more and a lot frequently more trauma to me to have them happen to me. Yeah. So what, what people are feeling in terms of going, oh, well, I don't wanna talk about that, that hurts me. I wasn't the one doing that stuff. Just think about it in the eyes of somebody that's dealing with those slights, that's dealing with those situations, that's being judged, that doesn't have the luxury to disengage on these issues. That's happening to them all the time. And it's not reasonable, if I recognize your humanity, for me to expect, if I've had something done to me, if I come every day, or let's, let's, do, it, let's do it this way, and no, I, don't, I don't wanna seem crude about it. No, but it's if, okay, if just be every, raw. If, if, if every day, I don't know, you went to get your newspaper, you know, it was delivered in front of your house and it was stolen, okay? And then I came up on one day and I took your newspaper, okay? You don't react to that the same way as if that happened one time. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying if somebody's a victim of something over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, it's telling them, oh, well, just calm down and just be reasonable about it is, is an unreasonable thing because they're, they've been, they've been, it's a lifetime know, of victimized, they like, slighted yeah. constantly. They're dealing with some stuff from the mistreatment for so, decades. Yeah. I, I, I want this so desperately to change. And I know I'm not the only one. I know there are people of all colors that are just really ready to make change happen, like aggressively. I mean, that's why we see the streets of LA filled up. That's why we see these murals, Black Lives Matter, leading up to the White House. It's why everyone's so engaged right now. And Dan, how do we make those changes in everyday life? Like, I, I'm going to use an example here that um, really got to me. Uh, up where I come from in Minnesota, I, I don't even like saying that state anymore. Um, it was, we were raised that- the Hey Miranda, Civil Prince yeah. is from Minnesota. There's nothing inherently wrong about Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll reclaim it when we start focusing on Prince. Um, I love, I, I'm, I've been so proud of my home state. So this has really just shaken my core too, because it's such a big part of my identity and something I was so proud of is like something shameful. So I'll, we are all working past different dynamics of, of how this shapes our culture. And I think we like to think that we were over this, right? Like when we took our history classes and learned about the civil war, it was about sectionalism. It's all solved. It's done. Never. I think it was like a one or two day section in our history books covering the whole thing, slavery, all of it. And it was a little bit and then on to the next thing. And it was never really talked about again. And so, so fast, fast forward, I'll wrap this up really quick. Cause I want to hear more of what you have to say. It's okay. Um, fast forward. This was only a few years ago, probably three, four years ago. I'm at a hunting camp here, you know, old Florida. Mm -hmm. And the conversations and dialogues being had are mind boggling, like heart wrenching. Like how can you people say, think and do the things that you're doing right now and have that be okay? Like laughing and joking, having a beer, saying the things you're saying. And um, 
I spoke up. I spoke, I couldn't not speak up. I was irate and offended. Like, how can you be saying these things? And um, needless to say, they weren't used to having someone speak up because in mm -hmm. their sphere and in their world, that's their normal. People don't question them, people don't, but it was so far out of my normal of human decency, respect. You know, how do we help people break down those bubbles and have the courage to have the hard conversations in the moment? Because that's, I think, where the impact happens when we're at the grocery store and such. You know, you're, you're, you're right to call it out. I, I would say this, that you can't, it's not gonna be successful calling it out in every situation. Uh, I, for one, I've kind of, I've, you know, again, you're, you're reaching me a moment right now and I've, I've kind of had it. Like there's stuff I'm not willing to, um, I'm not willing to abide anymore. I'm done. I'm done. I'm over it. So the, the sort of slight, so, I'll so, so one of them is this, um, uh, the, these Confederate statues. Okay. Um, oh, I, I even saw a post yesterday, yesterday from a guy I've been doing business with probably for about 20 years. And he said, it's, it's heritage, not hate, these statues. That completely denies the context of the history of where, when they started to appear, what they were intended to put across, what they represent, and the reality of how they actually hurt other people in America. So... It, it, it was, there, was a, there was a meme that says, we can agree to disagree on a lot of things. Um, racism isn't one of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not about, in a, in, in a, we've drifted so far in this country towards tribalism. Mm -hmm. You know, my side must win no matter what, or politics. I'm for this guy, so nothing else matters. Well, it does matter. Mm -hmm. It does matter. And you cannot claim the humanity in yourself or recognize it in other people, if you don't acknowledge that, it does matter. It all matters. It's causing hurt. How do I hurt somebody else and then ignore it and then pretend that, that it's, it's meaningless to me? Yeah. Because, my God, you just, you, just, you just hurt another person, another human being. Could you imagine having that done to you or to someone that you love and someone being so callous about it? Yeah, the police report came back for Brianna Taylor, and it she she shot eight times, and it comes back clean as if nothing happened. So you're gonna you're gonna tell me that you know and, and listen, that's not meant to condemn all police. I'm not a, I'm not a student of that or all law enforcement or any of that stuff. I'm 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 not that guy, right? You know, I I I I get why we have, you know, a need functioning. Um, 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 law enforcement agencies and and those things. I'm just saying to to be de in denial about what's really going on. Yeah, you don't get to do that anymore. And I don't have to. I don't have to. Um, I don't have to uh, make try to make you feel better about yourself for doing it. So I hope she doesn't mind. That I share this story. I was having an exchange with my um, sister. And she was talking about um, NASCAR's now banned um, the Confederate, Confederate flag. And, you know, part of what she was saying is, you know, well, you know, I wish they had, you know, made a change and put some money towards an HBCU or something like that. And I was saying to her, you know, hey, I hear you. I understand what you're saying, but these symbols do matter. You don't go to Germany and see a bunch of swastikas um, around and you don't get to sport a symbol of oppression, oppression and hatred and racism and just claim, hey, you're just having a good time. It's not okay. It's not acceptable behavior. Uh, I, I, you know, if you want to go out and, you know, hoot and holler and have some beers and sit in the infield, I'm good. Enjoy yourself, knock yourself out. Okay. But if you want to do that while you're, you know, waving a, 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 a flag that represents hatred towards me, I got a problem with that. So, you know, should that be illegal in the United States? No, it, you know, we got rights as Americans, right? It's your, it's your right to do that stupid racist thing, but that's what it is. It's a stupid racist thing. And, and you, you, you know, you, you need to be called on that. 
Jim Hobart, it, Jim Hobart, if you're watching right now, please, please, please post the video that you posted in the Catalyst group uh, last night. It is so on point with everything Dan's saying and affirming it. Um, I really want that to shine through. I almost tagged him, but I want to focus on what you're saying here, Dan. I could not agree more. Symbolism is such a strong, meaningful way to kind of incognitively ingrain things within people. It creates, it, we're image focused. Our brains operate on imagery. So when you tie that imagery to so much meaning, it's a passive aggressive way for people to punch you in the face without punching you in the face. Yes, you know, it, yes it is. It's uncalled for. You you can be emotionally and emotionally and mentally abused by that symbolism on every front by someone who can stand next to you and say, "Oh, I didn't mean it like that." And you know, you know they like at some level, if you're not standing against that, you're standing for it. And people yes. need to realize that. Yeah, yeah. It's it it it's so. It, and this is you know a lot of people are struggling to understand but it's not enough to not be racist. You need to be anti-racist. You need to help move the needle. Um, that's what the world's crying out for, for people to do that now, to take active steps. Listen, we people have and are gonna have and have always had some level of bias, but you have to recognize that when you're, when you're, when you're putting forth, so when you're, when you're exercising some bias, when, you're, when, 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 that's, when that's kicking in, if you're if you're the the hiring um, manager, and you have um, you know ten candidates that you that you're looking at, and you're gonna you're, you you realize you have a hiring pattern that everybody that you hire, you know, looks like you came from the same school that you went to, is somebody that you want to hang out with, you know, on the weekends. I'm gonna I'm gonna say something's probably wrong. Yeah. You know, you need to reconsider that. You need to think. Who are, you, who are you hiring? Who are you promoting? Who are you working with? Who are you doing business with? Um, this is a thing that happens, something happens in our business. I mean, you, you, if you're going to go and do business, you know, in a diverse setting, which we all should be doing, you know, working in these, working in, um, you know, different client, different, different client groups. And here in, in Orlando, we have more opportunity than anywhere to show, work diverse right. in a diversified room. Show up with a team that looks like that community. Don't show up with a team that, you know, doesn't look anything like them and, and, and or has no participation from anything like them. And, and because that's all baked in, um, you know, a level of baked in elitism as well. So it's, it, it, it's we have to actively um, fight these things. I apologize for interrupting you. You just, you make me feel so exuberantly excited to hear you stand for this. And, you know, not only who we work with, but who we mentor, you know, are we mentoring someone who looks just like us? You and I both work in professional spaces where a lot of our friends and colleagues are either uh, mentees or mentoring someone like that should be a very diversified realm also of who yes. we're touching and interacting with um, every day, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of us were faced with even the most good meaning, well-intentioned, or I'm just gonna to speak to Orlando because that's what we know and where we're at. Yeah. Um, citizens here amongst us with white skin um, have noticed that maybe our social circles, like we might be connected to or acquainted with people in diverse backgrounds, but who are we really spending our time with, you know? our happy hour cocktails, our brunches, who, who are sitting side by side next to us? You know, who, who are we really friends with? And um, for right. me, who, I'm- who, who, who have you invited over for dinner, right? Yes, <laughs> who do you call up and say, hey, it's been a long week, can we just chat for a bit? And I realized that my social circle is way too monochromatic. And, you know, and I'm sure a lot of my well-meaning friends are seeing the same things in their social circles. And so not only is this an opportunity for us to speak our raw, authentic truth about our thoughts and feelings on this topic, 
but I really want people to get to know Dan Kirby, our friend, and you know, our passionate sustain your focus on sustainability architecture, so many things here in the community. But who are you? Like how many of us know that you came from Newark, New Jersey, and you know, transferred through this progression through your school systems? Like who how many people really know you? And yeah, yeah, yeah. probably I'm, not that many. <laughs> <laughs> and that's I mean, you know, despite it's despite the thousands of people on the social media list, right? Right, 5,000 people, but who's paying attention? You know, you want them to know you. And in addition to your family pictures, you know, know your story. And I'm so grateful that you're being raw and vulnerable because I know how hard, if it's hard for me, just as an empath, as a white girl who's privileged, I can't imagine. I, you know, I, I'm sorry that you're feeling what you're feeling with and struggling with what you're struggling with. And you have every right not to want to talk to anyone about this. So I feel very grateful um, that we're dialoguing and opening this up because that's my hope and dream is that the little conversations trickle out into actionable change for people. We, we should spend a moment on that and kind of yeah. the expectation of that. So you and I are talking, you and I were friends before this, so we're able to have this kind of conversation. However, you know, and, and I have done a lot of this kind of dialogue myself yeah. in the past. Um, I am um, part of a, a group um, at the Holocaust Education Center that is trying to bring an exhibit here of a guy named um, Daryl Davis. And Daryl is a musician, but Daryl's also known for, and you can kind of, you know, Google his name. He's known for interacting with members of the clan and starting conversations. And Daryl's even taken it as far as he's gone to clan rallies and he's spent lots of time with these folks to try to bring them around in these critical conversations. Well, I'll tell you flat out, you know, I met, I've met Daryl. Dan Kirby is not Daryl Davis. Okay. I'm not doing that. I'm not, I'm not having any of that, but there's, there's, there's a continuum. Okay. There is a spectrum. Uh, at this point in my life, I'm not doing that. I will, I will have a dialogue with people that want to have a dialogue. I'll have difficult conversations so I can do that. Yeah. But in the context of those things, if you have a Daryl Davis, you have a Dan Kirby, you have, um, you know, other people, that is a burden and you cannot automatically impose that burden on an African-American person. You can't expect them to be representative and spokesperson for their race automatically. So that's why kind of when we were talking, I said, this needs to be friends talking because, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to take on, you know, the burden of having to come to you and parcel it out to you so that you can get it. We need to be equals having a conversation. Any more than, so there, there's that attitude, right? And then there's also the paternalistic attitude of, and, and by the way, there's no way I could speak for every African-American, right? There's more African-Americans in the US than there are Canadians in Canada, I think. So, right, so it's, <laughs> it's, it's we're, we're not all so the same one monolithic group, right? But, but, but so you have that, so, you know, if somebody thinks they're gonna get by, like, oh, I have a, a black friend and therefore I'm absolved, that doesn't that doesn't work. That doesn't work. Okay. You can't you can't do that. And you can't put somebody on the spot and say, you have the burden now of explaining this to me. They may want to share, offer them the opportunity, open the dialogue, but it can't be an expectation. I guess is the point I want to make, particularly now when a lot of people are raw and hurting. You yeah. could say, hey, I'd, I'd be interested. If it's okay, I'd like to talk to you about this but you can't demand it because that in and of itself is an act of privilege. Heard and understood yeah. and respected. I really respect that. And not, no one should have to bear the burden of this. It's, I think my soul sits in a place of wanting us to collaborate and connect and for people to ask Dan, what can I do for you? What do you need right now? And for us to just treat each other like people, right? Like friends, like what would you do for your neighbor? What would you do for your friend? And I feel like people deserve to be genuinely heard and authentically listened to for who they are and their story. And I believe that everyone has an extremely unique path um, and an extremely unique destination. 
Well, we all never know, right? And this is you know, just life in general. Yeah. You don't know what a person's dealing with on any given day. And, you know, they may be badly hurt, right? It's, it's the, you know, leave somebody better than you found them. You know, do, please try to do that. We can't always do that, but we all ought to be trying. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a, um, a biblical perspective in that, um, in, in, in um, what I, I, I forget who said the quote, but it, it's a, uh, it was a perspective actually, I think my pastor shared with us, it says that we don't really understand who we are as Christians until we see ourselves through the eyes of somebody that's been left out. Ooh, wow. So understand the stranger, the yeah. person that's been left out, the minority, the yeah. downtrodden. That's how you understand what we were intended to be. And we're, 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 and we're all, we're trying that. We're aspiring to that. You know, <laughs> we're, 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 we're all convicted. We're all guilty. None of us are are, 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 are walking the, the perfect path. These are aspirational things. And let's, let's acknowledge that about each other. God bless you for sharing that, that, that hit deep, but goosebumps everywhere with that statement. Um, I know I want to be courteous of your time. You have a hard stop here in a second, and you're more than welcome to chat with me whenever I will make myself available to you. If you want to further this conversation, um, I, I just, I want to remind everyone out there what Dan said is so true. Right now, we're all struggling. Going into this year, it's an unpredicted, unexpected year. Just the COVID-19, Dan and I were speaking off camera about how difficult it is to be socially distanced when we're super social extroverted people. Like that's how we charge up. That's how we, you know, the hug, the smile in a big room. It's how we fill our life with light. And people are drained right now. They're drained and they're tired and they're stressed. And I talked to a good friend whose you know, brother is dealing with stage four lung cancer and all of this. And then you add George Floyd on top of it, guys, it's a pancake layer of stress that everyone's just trying to get by making it through each day. So if anything Dan said today inspires you to just embrace the better side of yourself and be a better person for the friends and family and neighbors that are around you, give them a verbal hug, give them an emotional hug, ask them what they need from you. Cause that's what we can do right now. I think. Yeah. Speak up for somebody. Yeah. Dan, let me know. Don't ever be afraid to reach out to me, call or text me and let me know how I can help you. I give you my heart and that genuine commitment because that's how we make the world a better place. That's, that's great, Miranda. Hey, I think we should, could we just maybe, yeah. we can put them in the chat or something, but yeah. you know, leave people with some resources if they do want to, um, yes. uh, talk about some of this stuff because I think they are um, there that's important to do um, absolutely you know I know there's lots of reading lists and stuff out there um, I want to commend a, there, there's a book I, I'll commend to people to read uh, it's called so you want to talk about race uh, it's by Ilamo uh, Oluo it's that's um, here I won't even spell it just look up so you want to talk about race it's a it's, a, it's a it's a popular um, uh, 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 book I think that's a good one. Another one's um, white fragility. Um, there, there are, there are, there are lots of them that tell stories. I think um, just wanting to to both understand the stories of different people and then understand um, 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 where where you fit in that. I think it's so it's so critical. Um, and again, there there there's so many of these that that you know would in, allow people to kind of engage in these dialogues and and and, and do this work. Uh, if they're only willing. And I, I would challenge that if you want to be the best you, if you want to be a complete person, you can't ignore this side of life and of your existence. Mm -hmm. You need to be open to um, uh, uh, recognizing how you become better and more complete by helping someone else to do the same. I don't need to say anything else. You. You said it all. All right. Thank you. Take care, friend. Take care. All right. I really appreciate this. <laughs>